Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this solo video, I want to take you through some more of the darkest disappearances that still to this day remain a mystery. So whether this video will be like a warning, or you can keep an eye out for these people who disappeared in the strangest of circumstances, I will leave that up to you. From a disappearance which led to a ring of evil in the backwoods, to an entire family that went missing not once, but twice, and still right now, nobody knows what happened. Settle in, let's give it a go. So to begin with, well, I, I wouldn't say actually any of the disappearances in this video have a good explanation, but let's start with the ones that are semi-explainable. We'll do it iceberg style again before getting to some of the darkest and creepiest disappearances. And I really mean it. Though in this one, we're pretty much just diving straight into the deep end. Hannah up. So here's something very odd. A woman who disappeared three times. In September 2008, 23-year-old Hannah Up was due for her first day at teaching in a middle school in Harlem. She was excitedly looking forward to it. There was only one problem. That day, all the students in her class filed in, sat down at her desk, Grant. But Hannah didn't, didn't file in. She did not walk in at all. In her apartment, her wallet, passport, her phone, just no sign as to where she could have gone, and no indication as to why she hadn't shown up at work. Then, almost two weeks later, she was spotted on CCTV at an Apple store in Midtown Manhattan. She was seen walking in, opening her Gmail, and then leaving. Authorities in New York say a teacher who disappeared just before the first day of school has been spotted. 23-year-old Hannah Up disappeared August 29th, just days before classes were set to begin. Police have been looking for her ever since. The disappearance of Hannah was, was everywhere, so as she was actually walking in, to this Apple store, someone said, hey, you, you know, you know, senior picture in the news, are you that missing teacher? Hannah, pff, ah, that won't. no, it's, it's not me, don't worry about it, it's fine. Tracking that sighting led nowhere. Then over the next week, she was spotted again and again around Manhattan, at a Starbucks, a sports bar. But every time people tried to chase down a lead, she swiftly disappeared into the bustling streets once again. Then, almost three weeks after she was reported missing, she was spotted bobbing in the water, face down near the Statue of Liberty. She was spotted by the captain of the Staten Island Ferry. She was swiftly rescued and she was alive, like by a miracle. She, how the hell she survived there in the water, how long she was there for, she was there face down. Incredible, she survived and she was taken to hospital. And then, you know, she, she made a full recovery. She had no recollection of where she'd been for the past three weeks. She didn't even know true, the first, one of the first things she said was, oh, hey, you know, I can't wait to start school tomorrow. Not realizing, almost a month. That was a month ago. She was questioned and the last thing she remembered was going for a run and that was it. She underwent tests and doctors could find no neurological reason for what had happened. So that was kind of it. She went back to school and, you know, it was weird, but we're kind of hoping it doesn't happen again. It did, four years later. This time, Hannah was working at a Montessori in Maryland and like the previous time, first day of class, she was a no-show. Her purse, wallet, and phone were found on a wooded path, and a search of the nearby woods revealed nothing, and it was determined that she hadn't slept in her apartment for a few days, and no one had spoken to her. It was the day after she was reported missing that her mother received a call from an unknown number. It was Hannah. She had recollected herself. She was in a dirty creek about a mile from the school. She had wandered and asked to borrow somebody's phone. She, like the first time, she had no idea what had happened. That's twice she entered some kind of fugue state and only was able to recover herself after being near entering water. After that, she went back to work and she seemed once again fine. But as you can imagine, everybody was worried about her. They talked about putting an ankle monitor on her in case it happened again, which it did for the final time. In 2013, Hannah accepted a position at a school in St. Thomas, US Virgin Islands. Nice, then all Caribbean way. She was living there, she was teaching. She was there for about four years, living on the, on the quieter side of the island, and she was having a great time there. She was loving life. It's in paradise. On September 6th, 2017, Hurricane Irma hit the island, an extremely powerful hurricane that caused widespread destruction. She and her roommates, you know, they, they huddled up, they, they waited, they, they survived. 
unscathed, while the island itself was decimated. Hannah was there, she texted her friends that she was safe, but said the island was unrecognizable. Then, six days later, Hannah went to the house of her ex-boyfriend, presumably just to see if he was okay. He was actually, he was gone. She, he had left a note saying he'd gone to the harbour because another hurricane was bearing down on St. Thomas. All these ships were trying to take as many people off the islands to safety as they could. Her ex-boyfriend was like, Hannah, you know, Hannah, come, come. Hannah said no. She was going to weather the storm, she was going to wait it out, she was going to hunker down. And that was when Hannah started acting strange again. For example, the following day she was at school, helping prepare for what was coming. But other people said she was acting like a robot. Like giving one word answers, that sort of thing. Not talking, staring off into space, like she, she just wasn't there. Her roommates were all trying to get off the island, but not Hannah. Then, once again, she told her friends one morning, going into work, going into school, she got into her car, they see her, they see her drive off. But she never arrived at the school. It was at exactly the same time of year as her previous two disappearances. And knowing how they found her previously, they went to check near water. Water would somehow revive her from these fugue states she went into. In fact, they went to her favourite beach and they found her stuff there at a bar at the beach. Um, her like purse, phone, wallet, all that sort of stuff. Employees at this beach bar said they, they found them in the sand on the beach and they recovered them, hoping somebody would come back. Her car was also at the same beach. They went out looking, but the hurricane, second hurricane was fast approaching. They didn't find it, the hurricane hit, destruction again, and Hannah is still missing. Likely if she drowned her body would float to the surface, but they never found her before or after the storm. They checked shelters, abandoned buildings, hospitals, but still to this day no one knows what became of Hannah Up. Philip's family disappearance. Now for what may be one of the crazier stories in this video because this is a family that went missing not once but twice are still missing to this day and one of the strangest things is that just a couple of months ago they may have been, vol been involved in a bank robbery. So in New Zealand 2021 is when this story begins. A man named Thomas Phillips, 36 years of age, was living in Otorohango with his three children, Jada, 10, Maverick, 8, and Ember, 7. Thomas had divorced his wife a number of years previously. It seems like Thomas had full custody of their three children and he lived uh, with them in like the family farm. They had this big family farm, kind of like a little bit out of town, a place they had lived for like four generations. They were well known, the Phillips family were well known in the local area. Now Thomas, real outdoorsman, uh, he loved camping, hunting, all of that sort of stuff. He was very experienced in the bush, but on September 11th, 2021, Thomas and the kids Vanished. A big search and rescue operation continues for a father and his three children on the rugged west coast of the North Island. Remote Kiritahere Beach is where Thomas Phillips' ute was found on Sunday. The vehicle was swamped with seawater, but there was no sign of him or his three young children. When the car was located, uh, waves were crashing into it. At that point, um, members of the community uh, went and retrieved the car and then notified family. The family was last seen six kilometres away on Saturday in the small town of Marakopa, where Thomas Phillips grew up. His car was found on a beach, seemingly abandoned. And when authorities, family, you know it, were all alerted, the fear was that the entire family, Thomas and his children, had been swept out to sea. The waters were very rough that day when it's believed they had been there. A freak accident, they all maybe gone for a swim, a rogue wave had took the three of them out, never to be seen again. Now, a major search was done, hundreds of locals and volunteers, but nothing. They couldn't find any sightings of them. And the search was eventually suspended after 12 days. Then, five days after the search was suspended, so they haven't been seen for 17 days, now, guess who walks into the Phillips family farm? Tom and the, and the three children, a big shit-eating grin on Tom's face, not a bother on him. Five days ago, the search was suspended, fearing the worst. Then today, they walked back home into the arms of overjoyed relatives. It's all good. Bring the babies home. They were all safe in great spirits, but as you can imagine, everybody was extremely pissed off. Rightfully so. They thought they were dead. Turned out they had just been camping in the woods for like 
over about two and a half weeks, just neglected to let anybody, you know, know this. Everybody thought they had been killed in a tragic accident. Family, friends, authorities, not to mention the searches and the money spent to find them, and all that. People were relieved, but big mad. Now, due to all of the money spent on that search, Thomas was actually due to appear in court. That date was set for November 2021, but due to COVID, it was pushed to January 2022. Thomas would not make that January 2022 appointment because in December, Thomas and the Tree Kids vanished once again. This time, though, permanently. They were last seen on December 9th, but this time they did say they were going into the bush once more. Because of this, the police didn't, uh, they didn't launch a search immediately, right? They were, they were aware, they were like, all right, fine, you know, if you want to go camping, right, but be back for that court date. He was not back for his court date. They went out into the bush December 2021. This video you are watching is coming out in October 2023. They have still not been found, but they have been cited. As I said, Thomas didn't show for his court date and an arrest warrant was issued. He did later return to the family farm alone on February 9th, two months after they left. He'd come back to get supplies and he was telling his family members who were obviously really, really worried. He was like, this is just gotta grab a couple of things. Vieta, you here? Vieta, you're here in a few minutes. The kids are safe, but he didn't say where they were. Family members who met him said he looked rough, you know, beard, a lot of his hair was getting along, like he had been living in the bush for this entire time. Then he disappeared again. Now authorities, they did searches and the Phillips family said the authorities aren't searching hard enough, but they did search, they searched everywhere. Now New Zealand is huge, sparsely populated. There's a lot of bush out there, very dense bush. So it's extremely hard to find people out there, but no sign. In fact, it's actually believed that the Phillips family are getting help from someone. Police have launched a fresh appeal to find missing man Tom Phillips and his family. Despite extensive searches, police haven't been able to find Tom or his three children, Ember, Maverick and Jada Phillips. There have been sightings, but none conclusive. Until like a couple of months ago. In May 2023, Tom allegedly robbed a bank and shot a supermarket employee in Tequiti, just south of the family farm. They got away with cash and fled away on a motorbike. I say they because someone was with Tom, but nobody knows who that somebody with Tom who helped him rob a bank was. But they're still in that local area. The, the, the bank robbery happened like the next town over from where they lived. Then on August 2nd, 2023, it's believed he stole a Toyota Hilux. And after that, he was spotted at a supermarket wearing a beanie, glasses, and a mask. Tracking that led nowhere. And more recently, he was spotted stealing cold weather clothing from a house, and he was chased by the owner. It's kind of unclear in the reporting, but it seems there may have been a car chase with this guy trying to run Thomas Phillips off the road. Thomas managed to avoid that guy. He escaped, helicopters went after him, lost him. Nobody knows where Thomas Phillips and his three children who have not been seen in years are. Thomas has been seen, some mysterious person with him has been seen, but nobody knows what's up with the kids. So what the hell is going on out there? Are they getting help? Are the kids alive? There are so many questions to this still ongoing. So I mean, all of the stories are ongoing, but this story, there are updates right now. Bryce Laspisa. In 2013, 19-year-old college student Bryce Laspisa was driving uh, to his parents' home in, in Laguna Niguel. Bryce was a student at Sierra College in Rockland at the time, which is about a seven and a half hour drive north of his parents' house. There, he was a sophomore, and that August literally just started the semester and was excited to get back into his course, Industrial and Graphic Design. Now, Bryce was on his way back to his folks' house that late August evening. Uh, he was very close with his parents. They'd, in fact, they'd, it, They'd recently moved, all of them were recently moved to California from Illinois. And that evening, he, he really just felt like he needed to speak with them. He needed to see them. He needed his parents' support. See, although his freshman year had gone real well, at the start of his sophomore year, things were not going so well. Um, he had just broken up with his girlfriend and he began drinking a lot. It seemed like he was going through some stuff. Maybe it was to cope with the breakup of his girlfriend. Taking Vyvanse a lot, which is an amphetamine, uh, similar to Ritalin or Adderall, uh, diagnosed for people with ADHD, but he was knocking it back. And it was on August 28th that Bryce's friend, Sean, worried about him, called Bryce's mother, Karen, to say, 
well, he wasn't doing too good. His drinking, his drug use, and the fact that Bryce broke up with his girlfriend via text, saying she'd be better off without him, which is not good. And he had also just given his friend Sean his Xbox and a pair of like diamond earrings that he'd been given. It's also weird that Bryce gave his friend Sean his Xbox when his last Instagram post, Bryce's last Instagram post was him chuffed that he had bought Madden 25 at midnight. He was a big gamer. His last text to Sean read, I love you bro, seriously. You are the best person I've ever met. You saved my soul. So probably someone going through a severely depressive episode. His mother, Karen, offered to fly down to him, but Bryce said, I'll come to you. Specifically saying, I have a lot to talk to you about. He was then in his 2003 Toyota Highlander on the road. Now this is when things get, get pretty scary. At 1 a.m. on August 29th, Bryce called his mother. Now, she thought he was calling that, you know, saying he just arrived home and he was just checking in. But he actually said he was only an hour outside of Rockland. So he'd barely been on the road at all when he did, you know, he said he'd left hours ago. Then the next morning when she woke up, there was no sign of him. And at 11 a.m., Bryce's parents became worried when they were informed he had used their insurance's roadside assistance. So, he had had a breakdown on the side of the road, okay. So they followed up with their, road, uh, the ro their roadside insurance, right, to see what had happened, who had been contacted, yada yada yada. Because Bryce was not answering his phone. This in turn led then to a guy who owned a tire and gas station in Buttonwillow, a small town a little over halfway between Rockland and Laguna Niguel. This guy, Christian, told Bryce's parents, yep, yeah, I was out there, I was called out at about 9 a.m. I found Bryce and decided to road. It turned out he just ran out of gas, ran out of petrol in his car. So filled him up. That was it. Now he, this Christian was talking to, 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 to Bryce's parents. They're like, yeah, we still have no sign of him. So Christian said, nice guy. He said, I can head out to where he was a couple of miles outside of town, see if there's any sign of him. Christian went out there and Bryce had not moved an inch. This was hours later. And Christian said to Bryce, hey, you know, your parents are really, really worried. Maybe you should just give him a buzz, you know? Um, and then Bryce seemed to like snap out of it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll call him. And he took off. He drove off. Christian said he drove, he watched him drive away out of sight. But hours later, Bryce was still not home. His parents then filed a missing persons report and the sheriff's department were able to find him relatively quickly from his cell phone movements. He was now only a handful of miles from Buttonville. It seems that Bryce drove out of sight of where Christian had come back and, and spoken to him, and then pulled over once again. The officers who found him said he was in great form, friendly, didn't seem out of it or anything like that, and found no drugs or alcohol. So the police who found him said, call your parents, and this time he did. He said, yeah, listen, hey, folks, Michael and Karen, his parents, he said, yeah, I'm going to be home in a few hours, right? This time I'm actually going to make it. He didn't. Then at 2 a.m. on August 30th, Bryce, who should have been home a long time ago, he called once more, saying he was too tired to keep driving, that he would pull over and sleep, see you in the morning. Then at 8 a.m., finally, you know, finally, right, Michael and Karen heard a knock at the door, they raced down, expecting to see Bryce give him a big hug. Only it was a cop, not Bryce. It was actually a California Highway Patrol officer who said they had found Bryce's car in a ravine. Not good. It was found abandoned near Castiac Lake. It was down a ravine, it appeared it had crashed. The rear window was shattered. His phone, wallet still inside, and no sign of Bryce Lespisa. A 19 year old, his name is Bryce Lespisa, had been studying at Rockland Sierra College and has been missing since last Friday. KCRA 3's Kevin Oliver, live for us at Sierra College tonight. And Kevin, I understand you spoke with one of his former roommates just this afternoon. That's right, and his former roommate said he moved up here to Northern California to go to school here at Sierra College to get a fresh new start in a new community. And now many here and his friends and family down in Southern California are trying to figure out what happened to him on that trip home. Now, from how he was acting uh, before, you might think that he, well, um, but the, the lake, the lake was searched. It was dredged, in fact. Every inch of that lake was searched. He hadn't gone in. CCTV would later show that after Bryce called his mother, remember saying that he was really tired, he's gonna pull over and sleep on the side of the road in his car. That's not what he did at all. He pulled over, but kept driving, went down this like dirt road leading to the lake. But what did he do with the lake? What happened to his smashed window? Like he, likely it, it went down a ravine, maybe it was dark and he accidentally drove over the ravine, 
smash it to get out. Maybe he was disoriented and something happened, but it didn't seem like he went in the lake. The search was huge. The lake was searched. All the areas around the lake were searched. They could not find him. They brought sniffer dogs, right? Sniffer dogs found his scent. It led to a truck stop. Then it ended. Bones would later be found, in fact, at the lake, but DNA tests would say it was not Bryce. In fact, nothing of his, other than what he left behind, has ever been found. Whether he had a psychotic break, he, whether he went to start a new life, or whether something really, really terrible happened to Bryce Espisa, we may never know. Daniel Robinson the year was 2021, and 24-year-old Daniel Robinson was working as a geologist, something he had studied at the College of Charleston in South Carolina. He was working near the city of Buckeye, Arizona. Now Daniel loved the outdoors. I would hope so, if you like rocks. So he was in charge of taking care of some of the remote desert sites for his employer, Matrix New World Engineering. He had been working there over the summer of 2021, but on June 23rd, 2021, he left his work site never to be seen again. He was at the remote job site in the desert testing groundwater, and just after 9am he left the site in his blue 2017 Jeep Renegade. He was due to be at that site all day, so no one's kind of sure why he left, but no one's even more sure as to where he went. Now this wasn't entirely out of form for young Daniel, he was a very adventurous sort, he loved, you know, spontaneity, but he was also careful, as in like, if he's gonna go off somewhere, he would at least text, Hey, this is where I'm going. That same evening, a missing persons report was filed, but nothing was found, and the desert is very big out there. His phone was either off or out of range of cell towers, and a large scale search began. Ground and air crews looking out in that endless desert, but found neither Daniel nor his jeep. That was until a month later, when things got weird, and they got dark. I mean, it's already pretty dark when you got a person missing and no answers to where they went. But now, right on July 19th, his jeep was found. His jeep was found in an area that had already been searched. So, you're not gonna miss it. And the jeep was not in a good state. It was down a ravine, damaged and on its side. Inside was his phone, wallet, and other items, you know, you keep on you, like your keys and stuff. The airbags had been deployed, and it appeared that someone had been inside when it went down, and had been wearing a seatbelt. But there was no one there. This is like priceless pizza all over again. It was really, really weird. Somebody had been in that car. They could tell from the seatbelt that someone had been in it. But where were they in it? There was no trail of blood, no nothing. And Bryce's, uh, his like high-vis work vest and his boots were found like right beside. An accident investigator was in fact hired by the family, and they said, Investigating the accident, it looked staged. Adding a super weird twist to this is that in the week before he disappeared, Daniel had been texting a woman named Caitlin he had met. It appeared he'd wanted to meet up with her, but she wasn't interested. See, Daniel had met her while he was delivering for Instacart, you know, a grocery delivery service. I'm just guessing he needed a bit of extra, extra cash. So one day he was delivering alcohol to Caitlin and her friend at their place. Um, whatever, you know, at the door, they started yapping away, they got on great, they were joking, have a good, Caitlin friend actually invited him inside, shooting the shit, they exchanged numbers, and then that was that. But then Caitlin would say, Daniel got weird, clingy, odd, he began showing up to her house unannounced, numerous times, texting her all the time. She was like, she thought he was being a creep essentially. She said it made her feel very uncomfortable. In fact, the day before he was last seen, he texted her, the world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can, or we can, whatever to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, but yeah. The police report reveals when detectives extracted data from Daniel's Google searches in the week leading up to his disappearance. There were searches that stuck out, like love changed me, delete Instagram account, shooting Tempe, explosion, and I'm okay to do things I hate. But Daniel's dad, David, had just talked to his son on the phone and didn't hear anything alarming. Outside of the history for searching, uh, things like that, he, he definitely uh, did not display that openly. 
The new information in the report shows Daniel's phone at the crash site at 10.05 a.m. and it stopped tracking just after 10.30. That becomes very important with the other new details we learned a lot more about. A witness named Bill who claimed to have seen Daniel in the area after he disappeared. Bill noticed Daniel's new Jeep and said he was wearing a reflective work shirt and boots. He also noticed Daniel was missing part of his arm, which is consistent with Daniel's disability. At first, his theory seemed to have uh, be, uh, you know, been valid. And um, I even mentioned it in my uh, uh, family press conference that um, there was a second person that seen my son. But Bill claimed to have seen Daniel around 11.30 a.m., then changed his story to different potential sighting times, none that matched the data of Daniel's phone at the crash site by 10 a.m. The police report also cast suspicion that Bill may not have been truthful about a law enforcement background. Now, people interviewed Daniel's friends to see was he obsessed with her? What was going on here? Was he in a bad state? No, they said no, he, he seemed fine. He wasn't a depressive type and he wasn't depressed before this happened. So what happened? Was it a staged disappearance out there or is he still out there? Did something bad happen and there was a cover up? Who knows, but in the desert, there's still a mystery. Asia Degree. In the early morning hours of February 14, 2000, nine-year-old Aisha Degree vanished. This story is particularly scary, I mean, well, for a lot of reasons when you're talking about missing kids, but what is absolutely bizarre, she got up in the middle of the night and just straight up walked into the woods. What is also so strange is that that night, really bad storm, rain, thunder, lightning, right? So like that possibly the most terrifying time you could go disappearing in the middle of the night into the woods and Aisha was scared of the dark. She was scared of lightning and thunder. So what was going on? Let's start at the top. Aisha was born in August 1990 in Shelby, North Carolina, the second child of Harold and Aquila. They later moved to the small town of Lawndale and Aisha attended school, described as a good kid, very shy, quiet and sensible. She was a good student, a great basketball player and she dreamed of becoming an illustrator and a, and a writer. She was taught at an early age to be wary around strangers, so she was cautious, and she was also afraid of storms and the dark, which just makes what happened all the more baffling. On Sunday, February 13th, 2000, Aisha and her family went to church, then visited relatives, and were home around 8 p.m. The kids went straight to bed. Aisha, she shared, uh, she shared a bedroom with her older brother, O'Brien. Now, Harold checked in on them periodically throughout that very dark and stormy night. Every time he opened, popped a head in, he said they were there, asleep, quiet as a mouse. But at one point, O'Brien does remember hearing uh, Aisha's bed squeak, but that's it. He assumed she was just, you know, tossing and turning in her bed, but didn't hear anything else. Then the next morning, Valentine's Day, in fact, it was actually her parents' anniversary on Valentine's Day, Parents go in, you know, very early morning, but 6 a.m. O'Brien is there. Aisha's bed is empty. The house was searched, the yard, nothing. Panic. Then soon sets in. They go around, knocking on neighbor's door. Have you seen Aisha? No, nothing. The police were swiftly called. They arrived to begin the search at about 6.30 a.m. on Valentine's Day. What happened, it's believed, is that for some weird reason, Aisha got up in the middle of the night with her school bag that had been pre-packed and walked out the door of her house for some absolutely unknown reason. She was scared of storms, she was scared of strangers, she was scared of the dark, but so made her leave. The search was intensive, one of the most intensive in the state's history, but they couldn't find a single lead. Now the Degree family lived in the middle of nowhere, forests and fields on either side, all that searched. Now, witnesses would later come forward saying they had seen a young girl walking along the side of the road the night of her disappearance. Two witnesses said they saw her walking along in the middle of the storm. One motorist said they actually seen her and they were like, this is a bit weird, middle of the night, middle of the storm, what's a kid doing out here? They pulled over, right, to see if she was okay, you know, talk to her, whatever. They said that as soon as they did that, Aisha took one look at him, who had been taught to be scared of strangers, to be cautious around strangers, took one look at this stranger booked it into the woods, never to be seen again. A family that lived nearby would later alert the police that in a storage shed they had, they believed they found some of her things, that maybe during the storm, she sought shelter there. They found candy wrappers, a hair bow, a photo of a girl, but dogs could not find 
Aisha's scent. A particular uh, candy wrapper was a, a piece of candy that had been given to Aisha like two days before she vanished. So it's very likely she had been there and that was indeed her stuff. You know what's really weird? The picture of the girl they found. The girl in the picture was not Aisha. It was of a completely separate girl. No one knows who that is. Over six months later, Aisha's book bag and some of her items were found during the construction of a road. This was about 26 miles from her home. All the items inside, mostly clothing, belonged to Aisha, apart from one t-shirt that was found inside her bag that did not belong to Aisha. It's believed that Aisha had planned her leaving for a few days before she actually did. The reason it's believed it was planned is that her bag was presumably pre-packed because her brother didn't hear her packing her bag, which would have made a bit of noise. So she must have already packed it, therefore she must have planned it. Why though? No, it's not It's not believed she had any problems, any problems that would cause her to run away, like her school life was good, her home life was good. So what happened to her? Was it some misadventure? She ran away into the woods, something happened there. Did she run away and a predator, an opportunistic predator picked her up? But had she been lured out there that night either? Had someone been grooming her? Then now the family did not have a computer, so it wouldn't have been like online kind of stuff unless it was somebody she already knew. The family would have known, but that, and what happened to Aisha Degree, remains a mystery. Danielle Imbo and Richard Patrone. Now I got the story of Danielle Imbo and Richard Patrone, and thank you to Magoat, by the way, who posted this on the good old That Chapter subreddit. This story takes us to Philadelphia in the year 2005. Danielle and Richard had been in an on-again, off-again relationship. Both Danielle and Richard had kids from previous relationships, and Danielle was in fact even going through a divorce at the time. Danielle and Richard had dated as teenagers, and as adult life took over, they dated, they broke up, they met other people, they had a relationship, you know. Bing bang boom, they ended up together this time. On the evening of February 19th, 2005, Danielle, she went out for dinner with her family, having a grand old time, and then um, she asked if somebody would give her a ride to a bar where Richard was that night. So, she dropped her off at this bar, a place called Abilene's, South Philly. Her, Richard, having a great old time. They met up with some other friends. They were drinking, they were dancing, good times all around. So after a few sups at about 11.45 p.m. that night, uh, Richard and Danielle, they said their goodbyes. They were last seen walking out the door of this bar, Abilene's, in South Philly, presumably um, to get into Richard's car, his truck, Richard then was going to drop Danielle off at her home, and then he would head home himself. The night, up until this point, was very, very normal, as I said, until this point. Now, to note, nobody actually remembers them seeing them get into the car. they just seen them walk out the door of the bar. But the next morning, nobody, nobody could get a hold of either of them. What really started to worry people was, right, the following morning, Danielle had a hair appointment, which she did not show up for, which is like, all right, fine. A couple of hours later, though, Danielle's soon-to-be ex-husband was due to drop off their son at Danielle's when he dropped her, when he went to drop her off. She was not there. Now, Danielle, her world revolved around her baby son. She would not have missed her little guy, you know, for the world. That is when the searches began. The streets of Philadelphia were combed and nothing. Richard's car, his truck, was not found either. They just disappeared. Helicopters, you name it, and nothing. The weirdest thing about this case is not what they found, it's what they didn't find. Absolutely nothing. No physical evidence whatsoever. The search extended outside of Philly and into the Delaware River, and nothing. All these years later, still nothing. They walked out of a bar, they got into his truck in the middle of this city, and they drove into a black hole. But a good few years ago, the FBI stopped treating this as a missing persons, missing persons cases and as a, as a homicide. They decided that the lack of evidence was evidence in itself, that whoever, that somebody had done something to them, and that this had been a professional hit job on the couple. Now, this is still so bizarre. I mean, it's hard to hide one body. Definitely very hard to hide two bodies. How you can hide a truck? I don't know, but they figured it out. Maybe the police believe this had been orchestrated to a T. So who would want them dead? Well, things often lead to the estranged husband, who was Joseph Imbo. He had a history of threatening Richard, like 30 times. 
you know, telling him stay away from my soon-to-be ex-wife, stay away from her, you know, all, all that kind of shit. So, you know, did he do something, something, something? I mean, it's a story of her a thousand times already, but the night off, he was, he had an ironclad alibi, he was 50 miles away at a child's birthday party, and he was seen by a load of people. But then again, if this was a professional hit job, he wouldn't, you know, his alibi would be would be good. But of course, you know, Joseph has never been proven to have done anything, always denied he didn't do it. He did have lie detectors, which were proven inconclusive, but I mean, that's not a sign of guilt, really. Though so, you know, whether he had something to do with what happened to these two people, who knows, there are other theories. Um, one of the strongest ones is that they somehow ended up in the Delaware River, but along that route Richard would have taken, the river was dredged, searched, nothing. Carjacking was also possible that they had just been driving home, some guys went in, killed them both, brought the car somewhere, broke the car down, you know, stripped it, whatever. But that that lead was chased everywhere, you know, it could have been done, like a car could have been ripped apart. Nothing. Others have also theorized that Rich Patron, who worked in like a bakery, had some dealings with the mafia. Sopranos over. Now, um, there's kind of like no evidence though behind that, and his family have always maintained they never had any dealings with the mob in Philadelphia or anywhere like that. But the theories kind of just spin out from there. To this day, there is a 50 grand reward for information about the disappearance, but that reward remains unclaimed. Brittany Wood. Now, this last story is pretty sickening and it gets dark. Like pitch black dark. On May 30th, 2012, 19-year-old Brittany Wood left her mother's home at around 7.15 p.m. She told her mother, you know, she was going to meet with a friend, and that was it. Now, this was in Mobile, Alabama, a very hot, humid summer's evening, and Brittany's mother, Chessie, she, walked, she watched Brittany walk out of the house down the road to where her friend in a car was presumably waiting for her. Brittany's mother, Chessie, would later say, through the entire day, she was in grand form, you know. Good mood, good mood, up until the moment she was walking out. Then, she was in a real pissy mood, frustrated, mad. When Chessie asked her, hey, you okay, Brittany apparently said, you wouldn't understand. Now, Brittany didn't always have it easy. When she was young, she had been molested by her maternal grandmother's boyfriend. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison for that. And Brittany had come through the other side a strong person. She had a daughter of her own. She was close with her extended family her dad, who was separated from her mother, and she bounced around the place staying with various people. It was two days later, after she had last been seen walking out of the house, that things went from, okay, you haven't seen Brittany in a couple of days, but I'm sure she's fine, she bounced around the place, she's probably with friends. That's what people were thinking when they hadn't seen her. It went from that to, oh shit, this is horrific. Brittany's uncle, a guy named Donny Holland, was found in the woods near his home, which was not far from Brittany's home in the Mobile, Alabama area, he was found dead. He had a gunshot wound to the, to the back of the head. Now that, that has been ruled self-inflicted. The good old, uh, I took myself out of the field and shot myself five times in the back of the head deal. Doesn't seem self-inflicted. Now, of course, though, the family devastated, as you can imagine, right? So they, you know, that to uh, spread the word, let friends and family know, poor Uncle Donnie, right? Texting Brittany, hey, you'll never guess what happened to your uncle. That's when they realized they hadn't spoken to Brittany a couple of days. Nobody had. They couldn't get true to her. She was missing. Calls went to voicemail, texts unanswered. People then um, began calling that friend, you know, she had said she was going to meet that day on May 30th when she was last seen. People up. The friend, no idea what you're talking about. I haven't spoken to Brittany in ages. We were not due to meet up that day. So where was Brittany? Then it came out that Donnie, the old self-inflicted gunshot wound to the back of his own head, the gun that had done that, was Brittany's gun. She had just bought it for self-protection. Brittany Wood was reported missing on June 2nd, and searches were done, but nothing was found. It seemed that Donnie was in fact who Brittany had been going to meet that day, when something happened. Now time for the twist. Get this, at the time of Donnie's death, murder, self-inflicted murder, he was being investigated for being the head of this child exploitation incest ring that had gone on for generations. This had been within the entire family, including Brittany. This is like some true detective child abuse ritualistic sick shit. And the fact that this had gone on for generations is unbelievable. The day he got suicided, 
Donnie was in fact due to meet with an investigator who was investigating the claims of this child abuse incest ring. But instead, he got dead. So what happened during those days between when Brittany was last seen on May 30th to June 1st when Donnie died, died via Brittany's gun? Her last cell phone transmissions were from the exact same area where Donnie's body was found, so that's why they believe she'd gone to meet with him. She'd killed him. He'd killed her. We don't know. Huge searches through the entire area were done. Had she been killed, buried, and Donnie didn't want to face the repercussions of, of murdering his, his niece, maybe she was going to expose this? Or had she killed her uncle for what he was doing and had done to the entire family and then had gone on the run? Big story right now at 6 o'clock. More family members of missing teen mom Brittany Wood are behind bars tonight. Seven people arrested face charges related to an ongoing child sex abuse investigation. Wood went missing in May of 2012. In the aftermath of all of this coming out, just so you know how hideous this was, two of Brittany's uncles, two of her aunts, her own brother and mother were charged in relation to this child abuse ring, along with other relatives and family friends. It seems like everybody was involved in this, doing it, covering it up. Authorities think Brittany is likely dead. But the only person who may have known is worm food. But the fact that Donnie, the head of this entire thing, was shot in the back of the head with Britney's gun, um, kind of only points to one thing, in my opinion. <laughs> this is some twisted dark stuff out in those backwoods, and what happened to Britney? Who knows? Hopefully she's still out there in a better place than where she was coming from. And that will do it for this whole episode. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed part uh, part two of the scariest disappearances that still remain a mystery. Um, these sort of stories are always really, really interesting to get into because um, you can come across some wild ones. So yeah, if you guys uh, enjoyed it, like part three, there could be a part three. Uh, let me know your thoughts. But again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And yeah, you're listening. I'll see you real soon in the next all video. But until then, look after each other. Look after yourselves because I love you. Mike out.